assassination of John F. Kennedy. Friday, November 22nd, 1963. John F. Kennedy served as president during the height of the Cold War. During his presidency, he saw the increase of military spending on both nuclear and conventional forces and increased the number of U.S. advisors in Vietnam from 400 to 16,000. The Bay of Pigs fiasco, the failure of 1,400 Cuban exiles trained by the CIA to invade their own country, began at the start of his presidency. Then there was the Cuban Missile Crisis, resulting in the USSR and the USA signing the Test Ban Treaty, forbidding nuclear testing in the atmosphere. It also established the Hotline, a direct telephone contact between the White House and the Kremlin. During Kennedy's time in office, the Berlin Wall was built by the Soviets in order to stop refugees from fleeing from East Germany to West Germany. In Berlin, he delivered a speech challenging Soviet oppression and gave hope to the people of the city. But in the winter of 1963, the presidency of John F. Kennedy would be tragically cut short. On November 21, 1963, President John F. Kennedy and his wife Jacqueline departed on Air Force One for a two-day, five-city tour of Texas. He was to announce his candidacy for the 1964 presidential elections there because Texas was vital for his re-election. Texans needed to be convinced as the state was largely not in favor of Kennedy's civil rights policies and handling of foreign policies like the Bay of Pigs fiasco. The feuding among Democratic Party leaders there also hindered his chances of re-election, and they needed to be brought together. The next morning on November 22nd, Kennedy made a speech to a large crowd outside the hotel that he had stayed in at Fort Worth, and then made another speech inside, at a breakfast hosted by the local Chamber of Commerce. He would say in the last speech he would ever make, This is a very dangerous and uncertain world. We would like to live as we once lived, but history will not permit it. The presidential party left the Texas hotel and went by motorcade to Carswell Air Force Base, boarding Air Force One, and landing at Dallas's Love Field Airport a short time later. President Kennedy and his wife shook hands with an enthusiastic crowd and sat in the back seats of their limousine as part of the motorcade. Democratic Texas Governor John Connolly and his wife were seated in the seats in front of them. In front of these seats were two Secret Service agents. The president's next stop was the Dallas Trade Mart, approximately 10 miles away, where Kennedy was scheduled to deliver another speech. It's estimated that about 200,000 people lined the route to the Trade Mart. The limousine the president was traveling in was an open-top 1961 Lincoln Continental four-door convertible limousine that was called the SS-100X by the Secret Service. The motorcade moved through Dealey Plaza in downtown Dallas. Nellie Connolly, the First Lady of Texas, turned around to the President who was sitting behind her and commented, Mr. President, you can't say Dallas doesn't love you. Which President Kennedy acknowledged by saying, No, you certainly can't. Those were the last words ever spoken by John F. Kennedy. At 12.30 p.m., the motorcade was passing the grassy knoll to the north of Elm Street and moving towards the Texas School Book Depository. Then gunshots were heard. A bullet hit President Kennedy's neck and hit Governor Connolly's shoulder and wrist. A second shot then hit President Kennedy in the head, covering the limousine's rear interior with fragments of skull, blood, and brain. The impact was so severe that blood and fragments even landed on the Secret Service car that was following behind. The limousine sped off to Parkland Memorial Hospital within minutes, but it was already too late and doctor's efforts were in vain. Kennedy was declared dead at 1 p.m. Connolly would recover from his wounds. The country and the world was in shock. President Kennedy's body was taken from Parkland Hospital to Love Field and loaded onto Air Force One. At 2.38 p.m., sheltered on board Air Force One in case of further assassination attempts, Lyndon B. Johnson took the oath of office with Jacqueline Kennedy by his side, still wearing her blood-spattered clothes. The oath was administered by U.S. District Court Judge Sarah Hughes. Less than an hour earlier, a person had been arrested by the police. Witnesses had reported hearing and seeing shots from different directions, but several accounts mentioned the southeast corner window on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository Building. Only two employees from the building were missing, one who had walked outside and wasn't allowed back into the building by police at the time of the shooting, and another, Lee Harvey Oswald, 
who had only been working there for a month. He had been seen and described by the witnesses who saw him in the sixth floor window, so a description was sent out by the police. As he moved down the floors, he was encountered by Dallas police officer Marion L. Baker, who had his gun drawn. He was allowed to pass, however, because Oswald's supervisor identified him as an employee. Oswald had slipped out of the book depository after the shooting, had walked several blocks, caught a city bus, and then hailed a taxi that took him straight to his boarding house. There, he picked up a pistol and a coat and began to walk aimlessly. Oswald had already left the scene on a bus to his boarding house by 12.40 p.m., but the police did discover a rifle underneath some boxes and its shells by the window on the sixth floor as witnesses had described. The police identified it as a 7.65 Mauser, but later the FBI announced that the police were mistaken and the rifle was an Italian Carcano M91-38 bolt-action rifle. The second-hand Italian-made Carcano rifle had been purchased by Oswald earlier in the year under the alias A. Heidel. The Carcano was a notoriously inaccurate weapon, and for many it's hard to believe that with such a weapon, Oswald, despite his former military training, could hit a moving target like the President twice with such precision at a range of approximately 250 feet. Shortly afterwards, a Dallas policeman by the name of J.D. Tippett was patrolling his usual area and saw a man who fitted the Oswald description on the corner of 10th Street and Patton Avenue. After a brief exchange of words, Oswald shot Tippett four times with a 38 revolver, killing him in front of witnesses. Oswald ran to the nearby Commercial Street of Jefferson Boulevard. A man named Johnny Calvin Brewer noticed his suspicious behavior and followed Oswald for several blocks to the Texas Theater. Oswald ducked there without buying a ticket. Brewer hailed a police officer, Nick McDonald, who entered the theater accompanied by another officer. Both officers apprehended Oswald on the stage of the Texas Theater six blocks away from the scene of the crime at 1.50 p.m. When Oswald was arrested, he was carrying a forged identity card bearing the name Alec J. Heidel, the alias he used to buy the rifle. However, Texas law imposed no control over the purchase of weapons. There was no reason to buy it under an assumed name. So why did Oswald buy the rifle and a handgun by mail order under his assumed name? Curiously, Army Intelligence was known to have a file on A.J. Heidel the contents of which were destroyed before it could be acquired by investigators. On Sunday morning, November 24th, after being held for two nights, Oswald was being transferred from city jail to the county jail. The event was being broadcast live on TV for millions of Americans to see. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a man shot a pistol point-blank at Oswald, who died two hours later in Parkland Memorial Hospital. The man who fired the pistol was Jack Ruby, a local nightclub owner. He said that he killed Oswald to spare Mrs. Kennedy the discomfiture of coming back to trial. The state funeral for President Kennedy was held on November 25, 1963, with representatives from more than 100 countries and millions of viewers watching it on television. On November 29, 1963, President Lyndon B. Johnson created the President's Commission on the Assassination of President John F. Kennedy, also known as the Warren Commission after its chairman, Earl Warren, Chief Justice of the United States. Its 888-page final report was presented to Johnson on September 24, 1964. The Warren report concluded that Oswald, who had become a skilled marksman as a Marine, had fired three shots, one that entered Kennedy's neck and exited through his throat before hitting Connolly, one that hit Kennedy in the back of the head, the fatal shot, and one that missed the president, but ricocheted off a piece of sidewalk which injured James Taig. Many disagreed with these findings and argued instead that there had been a second shooter on the grassy knoll in Dealey Plaza, that the motorcade had been approaching, and there were witnesses who thought they had heard shots coming from the direction of a railroad beyond the knoll. The report, however, concluded that Lee Harvey Oswald and Jack Ruby had acted alone, although the findings of the Warren Commission continue to be controversial. Teddy Roosevelt, the president that kept reading a speech after being shot, 1912. The famous American Theodore Teddy Roosevelt was the biggest hero of the Spanish-American War of 1898, won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1906 for mediating an end to the Russo-Japanese War, and was the inspiration for the teddy bear toy.
One time he found himself in a bar fight when a cowboy was shooting wildly at the room, scaring the customers. The cowboy called Roosevelt Four Eyes in reference to his famous spectacles and followed Teddy around with his guns. Roosevelt hit him in the jaw with his left and right fists. Then the cowboy's guns went off and he hit his head on the bar, knocking him unconscious. Another time, Roosevelt's boat was stolen. Him and his friends built a boat from scratch in three days to hunt down the thieves. They tracked them down along the river while in temperatures as low as zero degrees Fahrenheit. When they caught the thieves, Roosevelt roughed up and captured the men and brought them back to be arrested. It's said that to pass the time on the journey back, he read poetry to the dangerous bandits. Roosevelt was elected vice president of the United States in 1901, but just over six months later, he became the 26th president when the current president, William McKinley, was assassinated after being shot twice by Polish-American anarchist Leon Czolgosz. At 42, Roosevelt became the youngest president in the nation's history. When the U.S. president refused to shoot a bear cub on a 1902 hunting trip, a toy maker named a stuffed bear after Roosevelt. Soon, the teddy bear fad swept the American nation. Roosevelt was also a mixed martial artist in jiu-jitsu, judo, and boxing. He loved boxing, and he continued to do it even when he reached the White House. He would often challenge professional boxers to hit him in the jaw as hard as possible and wouldn't hesitate to then knock them back. One day, Roosevelt challenged Colonel Dan T. Meade, a military aide at the White House, to a boxing match in the White House gym. Roosevelt demanded a tough fight. In the fight, Meade's punch landed on Roosevelt's left eye, damaging blood vessels and making him blind in that eye. After this, he continued fighting in jiu-jitsu and judo. Roosevelt was successfully re-elected for a second term as president in 1904 and served until 1909. He then decided not to try to be re-elected for another time, as he felt it was time for a younger man to take over. But by the time of the next presidential elections in 1912, he had become disillusioned about how his party, the Republicans, were running the country. So he stood as the presidential candidate for a newly formed Progressive Party, which was often referred to as the Bull Moose Party. It got its nickname because Roosevelt was often described himself as having the strength and vigor of a bull moose. His running for a third term as a president was considered controversial because he intended to break the American tradition of two-term presidencies. And while campaigning in Milwaukee in the state of Wisconsin in hope of being elected president once more, Roosevelt nearly suffered the same fate as McKinley. He was about to give a speech when John Fleming Schrank, a Bavarian-born saloon keeper, attempted to kill Roosevelt by shooting him with a revolver. The bullet struck Roosevelt in his chest but his life was saved as the bullet was slowed down considerably as it went in first through the heavy overcoat he was wearing, then the steel-reinforced eyeglass case in his breast pocket, and finally the 50-page copy of the speech he was about to give, before finally becoming lodged in his chest. The crowd screamed in panic, but Albert Martin, a secretary of the president and an ex-football player, leapt from his car and tackled Shrank to the ground. Soon, former Rough Riders, bodyguards, and policemen were upon the assassin and began hitting him. Roosevelt stumbled but then straightened himself and reassured the audience with a beaming smile. He turned to his aide, saying, He pinked me, Harry. The crowd demanded blood and for Shrank to be killed. It was only Roosevelt who seemed to be calm and wanted to prevent this, shouting, Don't hurt him. Bring him here. I want to see him. Roosevelt then asked the shooter, What did you do it for? When there was no answer, he said, Oh, what's the use? Turn him over to the police. Feeling the bullet hole in his chest, Roosevelt <laughs> coughed three times. As an experienced hunter and anatomist, he concluded that the lack of blood being coughed up meant that the bullet had not reached his lung. Roosevelt, feeling he was not seriously injured, insisted to the doctor that he was going to give his speech. The speech lasted for 84 minutes, despite the blood that could be clearly seen staining his shirt. He started the speech by saying, I don't know whether you fully understand that I've just been shot, but it takes more than that to kill a bull moose. Then when his speech was finally over, he allowed himself to be taken to the hospital, where the doctors decided it would be more dangerous to remove the bullet, and instead left it lodged in his chest muscle, where it remained for the rest of his life. Shrank, the would-be assassin, was later to claim he was told to kill Roosevelt by the ghost of the former President McKinley, who came to him in a dream. 
Roosevelt recovered quickly, but was not successful in his bid to be re-elected as president, and later devoted much time to being an explorer as well as a successful author. He died in his sleep from a blood clot on January 6, 1919, at the age of 60. As for Schrank, his trial he was deemed insane and spent the rest of his life in a mental institution. He died of bronchitis in 1943 at the age of 67. Gavrilo Princip and the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. On Sunday, June 28, 1914, Serbian nationalist Nadelko Chabrinovic threw a bomb at the back of a car carrying Archduke Franz Ferdinand. The bomb rolled off and wounded around 20 people behind the Archduke instead. Not the best start to an assassination that would lead to World War I. In 1914, Europe looked a little different from today. Most of the continent was divided between three major powers, the German Empire, Russian Empire, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire, with France, Italy, and a few other countries squashed in. It was that last one, the Austro-Hungarian Empire and its strained relations with its southern neighbor, Serbia, that is key to understanding why the assassination occurred. Serbia had grown to hmm. detest Austria-Hungary after it occupied its neighbor called Bosnia-Herzegovina, first in 1878 and formally in 1908. Hmm. Bosnia-Herzegovina contained a sizable Serb minority and was therefore believed by Serbian nationalists that it ought to be part of their own country. Serbia overthrew their pro-Austro-Hungary rulers hmm. some years earlier in 1903 and had established a government that wasn't too hmm. fond of the hmm. empire. By 1914, these tensions only increased as Serb and Bosnian Serb nationalists stoked the flames of the slowly growing fire by creating militant organizations to obtain their territorial objectives. And Franz Ferdinand's political desires, significant as he was next in line as the Emperor of Austria-Hungary, only fueled their anger. Ferdinand was in favor of a more unified empire, where its Slavic citizens in southeastern Europe would get better political representation. While sounding great on paper, to Serbian nationalists it would accomplish nothing but weakening their goals for a separate, larger Serbian nation, and so sought to prevent it. In May 1911, the Black Hand was formed, although back then it was better known as Unification or Death. It was a secret revolutionary organization whose name tied in with its ultimate goal to break the southern provinces from the Austro-Hungarian Empire and create an enlarged, supposedly ethnically united kingdom of Serbia. Although not part of the Black Hand, young, poor Bosnian Serb Gavrilo Princip, who had been radicalized since his youth, shared their sentiments and had befriended other radicals determined to change the tide of history, later being introduced to the Young Bosnia Group. Like many others, he believed Serbia had a moral duty to free Yugoslavs still under Austro-Hungarian control. Princip was just 19 when he met other Bosnian Serbs like himself after traveling to and living in Belgrade. Some of these later co-conspirators were students, others were already revolutionary exiles because of their socialist beliefs. Over the last 10 years leading up to 1914, there had been multiple attempts on government officials' lives by other nationalists. The most notable of this was Bogdan Zarajic, who attempted to assassinate General Marijan Varshani, governor of Bosnia in Sarajevo in 1910. He shot five times in his direction before turning the gun on himself. This is one of the events that spurred on Princip and his co-conspirators just a few years later. In 1913, relations between Bosnia and the rest of the empire had reached an all-time low. A state of emergency was declared by General Oskar Petiorek, leading to the dissolution of the Bosnian parliament, the imposition of martial law, and the shutdown of Serbian cultural and educational societies. This, of course, only incited Princip's rage further, and he formed a group with two other friends, Nedelko Chabrinovic and Trifko Grebesh, whose goal was to ultimately follow the earlier Zarajic's example, but with more successful results. 
they were not the only ones who had such designs. The Black Hand, who Princip was already friendly with, were already busy forming their own plans. In Sarajevo, a prominent member of the organization, Daniel Ilich, sent Chebrinovich a note, a newspaper clipping regarding the Archduke's planned visit, and a single word in the margins, greetings. Chebrinovich showed the paper to Princip, who had the same thought. This was their opportunity. This was not the young men's first encounter. Ilich and Princip were already friends, along with Chebrinovich and all members of the Young Bosnia Group, a revolutionary anti-Austro-Hungary group. Ilich would later claim he coordinated the attack completely, although in truth he had been less the puppeteer than the puppet. From there, the three boys consulted Major Tankosic, a Serbian officer and one of the founders of the Black Hand, who agreed to provide the group with weapons to carry out the attempt. They sent word to Ilic, who immediately organized things in Bosnia itself, arranging to send three other young revolutionaries to meet the others in Sarajevo. Their names were Sajetko Popovic, Vaso Chubrilovic, and Mehmed Mehmed Bastic. Armed with six bombs, four pistols, and a cyanide pill, each to be taken immediately after the assassination, the seven young Bosnians began their attempt. It was June 28, 1914. Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife, the Duchess Sophia, were to inspect a military garrison before traveling towards the city hall to open a new state museum. Daniel Illich had positioned the assassins along their route, each young man armed with a bomb. But it turns out, killing is a lot easier in theory than in practice. First, the motorcade went past Mehmet Bastic, who lost his nerve and failed to throw his bomb. The same happened next with Chubrilovic, who also failed to act when he saw the car coming. But the same cannot be said of Chubrinovich. When the car came down his part of the route, he summed up all the courage of a 19-year-old who had never seen war and threw his bomb, which promptly rolled off the back of the Archduke's car and under the wheels of the one behind in the motorcade, injuring around 20 people but killing none. What followed was more like a Looney Tunes episode than real life. Chabrinovich immediately swallowed his cyanide pill before jumping in the river. Unfortunately, the pills were old and ineffective, so rather than kill the young student, all it did was make him vomit. And rather than the river washing him away, Chabrinovich found himself standing in 13 centimeters of water as the river had dried up in the heat before being dragged out by police and beaten up before being taken into custody. The rest vanished into the crowds in the confusion, disheartened and angry their attempt had failed. But unexpectedly for all of them, that wasn't the group's last chance at the Archduke. After hearing others had been injured by the bomb, Ferdinand changed his plans to visit the museum, deciding instead he wanted to travel to the hospital and check on the injured. But that message did not reach the Archduke's drivers, who continued with the original plan. Meanwhile, Gavrilo Princip was lamenting the group's failures at the nearby Moritz Schiller Café when a twist of fate changed the course of history. Almost directly in front of the young rebel, the car carrying the Archduke was told to stop, the driver being told of his error. When the car came to a stop and put into a slow reverse, Princip saw his chance. Summoning his courage, he pulled out the pistol Tankosic had given him and at point-blank range shot Archduke Franz Ferdinand in the neck and his wife <clears throat> Sophia in the abdomen immediately after. Both were dead before they reached the hospital. In the aftermath, 25 persons were implicated in the assassination. Mehmet Bastic escaped to Serbia, but the others were not so lucky. Being over 20 years old, Chabrilovic, Ilyich, and fellow conspirator Jovanovic were executed, and Princip, Chabrinovic, and Grebsha found themselves imprisoned at Theresienstadt, where all three would die in the next four years. Interviews with Princip, Chabrinovic, and Popovic during their trials showed that these three at least did not regret their actions, but they also didn't anticipate what would come next. Just a month later, diplomacy and civility between Serbia and the Austro-Hungarian Empire had broken down completely. 
Serbia, with the knowledge of new support from the Russian Empire, still acquiesced to some of these demands by Austro-Hungary that included suppressing propaganda against the empire and allowing their officials to join the Serbian inquiry into the assassination. But without a complete agreement, Austro-Hungary responded by breaking diplomatic relations. The Serbian army mobilized, assured of Russian support behind it. Austria-Hungary too did not stand alone, however, having nurtured a pact of alliance with the German Empire. Seeking to assure their ally Kaiser Wilhelm II and his administration issued the infamous blank check to the Austro-Hungarian government, promising uncompromised assistance in their endeavors in the Balkans. Emboldened by their ally, on July 28, 1914, Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia, shelling the national capital of Belgrade that very night. What occurred in the days that followed was a near domino effect of hostility, as European powers and nations scrambled to honor pacts of friendship and alliance. Europe, as historian Christopher Clark has written, sleepwalked into war, triggered in earnest by an angry 19-year-old boy. Gavrilo Princip. Operation Valkyrie. The plot to kill Hitler. July 20th, 1944. World War II. Nazi Germany. The courtyard of the High Command Building in Berlin. It was early in the morning of July 21st, 1944, and in a courtyard lit by the headlights of an army truck, a 36-year-old colonel was placed before a firing squad to be executed for high treason. Just before he was shot, he cried out defiantly, Long live our sacred Germany. So who was this man? His name was Klaus von Stauffenberg, and apart from being an officer in the German army, he was also a war hero, having been awarded the Iron Cross First Class. He was also of noble blood, holding the grand title of Count of Stauffenberg, his family being one of the oldest and most distinguished aristocratic Catholic families in southern Germany. At the beginning of the war, Stauffenberg took part in the Polish, French, Russian, and North African campaigns. He was also the man who nearly assassinated Adolf Hitler. Hitler had survived several assassination attempts prior to this, but this was to be the very last. Stauffenberg's views on Hitler were conflicting. On one hand, he thought he was a good military leader and was impressed by the Fuhrer's grasp of military strategy. And he also thought he could save Germany from the corrupting dangers of communism. But he had serious misgivings about his social policies, which went against his strong Catholic, Christian, and political beliefs. Stauffenberg thought that World War II was an unnecessary war, feeling the conflict could and should have been avoided. This view was quickly reinforced as the war unfolded. He was first approached about joining the German resistance as early as 1940, but he declined out of loyalty to the oath he took to obey the office of the Führer that Adolf Hitler held. So at this stage, he felt honor-bound to not get involved with the resistance. But he became further disillusioned with what he saw when he took part in the invasion of Russia in 1941, and was particularly disgusted by the SS's violent treatment of the Jewish population. By 1942, he was meeting regularly with opponents of Hitler and coming around to the idea that Hitler's removal was the only way to save Germany. Stauffenberg was sent to Tunisia to join the Africa Corps to take part in the North African campaign. In April 1943, his unit was strafed by an RAF fighter bomber and he was severely injured, costing him an eye, his right hand, two fingers on his left hand, and damage to his legs. He spent three months in a hospital in Germany recovering from his wounds. Once recovered, he could no longer carry out combat duties, so Stauffenberg was assigned to the office of General Friedrich Olbricht in Berlin. Olbricht was the chief of the General Army Office. Among the many things that his office had worked on, Olbricht was to develop the contingency plan, Operation Valkyrie. This was to be used in case of internal uprising or unrest, which was becoming a possibility as Germany was losing the war. Ingeniously, the German resistance realized they could use this plan to mobilize the reserve army to suppress the Nazi government as the conspirators who were seizing control for themselves. For the plan to work, Hitler had to be dead, and this would allow for Operation Valkyrie to be activated and have his inner circle falsely arrested, framing them to look as if they were the heads of a fictitious coup attempt. 
Then the true conspirators would form a government more acceptable to the Allies, which they then hoped could negotiate a reasonable peace with them. Stauffenberg was crucial for this plan to work, as his duties in his new position included him attending regular meetings with Hitler and his high command. So a plan was formulated with Stauffenberg and his growing band of fellow conspirators, that he would have a bomb with a 10-minute timer hidden in his briefcase among his papers. They planned not only to kill Hitler, but his two closest and powerful trusted commanders at the same time, Reichsmarshal Hermann Göring and Reichsführer Heinrich Himmler. But this proved impractical, so on July 20th, 1944, they put their plan into action. Stauffenberg attended a conference at Hitler's command headquarters called the Wolf's Lair Complex in East Prussia. The original plan for the conference was that it was to be held in a secure underground concrete bunker, but at the last minute, perhaps because of the extreme heat of that summer day, it was decided to hold the day's meetings in a more spacious, above-ground and well-ventilated conference room. Around 20 people attended, including Hitler. Stauffenberg had already set the fuse when he entered the conference room. He then placed the briefcase under the giant oak conference table that everyone was crowded around as Hitler was pointing to various maps. Then a prearranged phone call gave Stauffenberg the excuse that he needed to leave the room straight away. Shortly afterwards, at 12.42, the bomb exploded, completely wrecking the conference room, blowing out its walls, causing the roof to collapse, and starting several small fires. The meeting stenographer was killed instantly. Three officers died a few days later from their injuries. Many others were also injured. Unknown to Stauffenberg and his co-conspirators, Hitler had survived the blast, though his right arm had been badly injured. It was also said his trousers had been blown off by the force of the explosion, but in reality they were torn to shreds. Stauffenberg, believing Hitler was dead, had immediately driven away from the wolf's lair and took a plane back to Berlin, ordering Operation Valkyrie into effect. Units of the German Reserve Army were mobilized and took control of radio stations, telephone centers, and key government buildings. At this time, there were conflicting reports on Hitler's status after the explosion. Then the Reserve Army, also believing Hitler was dead, made arrests of the leading members of the framed Nazi government, thinking they were putting down a coup when in fact they were unwittingly aiding one. Major Otto Ernst Riemer was ordered to arrest Minister of Propaganda Joseph Goebbels. However, the truth came out when Goebbels handed Riemer the telephone and he heard Hitler's voice on the other end. Realizing he had been taking orders from mutineers, Riemer was now ordered to crush the plot by Hitler. The conspirator's plan was brilliantly simple, but quickly fell apart when it became apparent Hitler was still alive and the truth was out. All of those involved were quickly rounded up, including Stauffenberg, who was arrested after a short shootout where he was wounded in the shoulder. Colonel General Friedrich Fromm, who had been a quiet supporter of the coup, betrayed them once it had failed. Stauffenberg and three other of the officers involved, Quirnheim, Ulbricht, and Werner von Haften, were hastily tried in a court-martial and taken to the courtyard of the Bendler block where they were shot. This was against the orders by Hitler to arrest the conspirators alive, most likely to hide Fromm's involvement in the coup. Few of the conspirators evaded capture and many chose suicide rather than face torture and humiliation at the hands of the Gestapo, the much-feared secret police. So after rushed mock trials that were ironically called the People's Court and sham court-martials, it's estimated nearly 5,000 Germans were executed for their direct or indirect involvement in the plot. They were executed by various means, hanging, guillotining, firing squad, and even strangulation. Stauffenberg's own brother was one of those slowly strangled to death in a Berlin prison in August. Since the war, streets, schools, and buildings have been named after Stauffenberg in recognition of the sacrifice he had made to rid Germany of the tyrant that was Hitler and the Nazis. Who killed William II? 1100 AD Nearly a thousand years ago, on a summer day in 1100 AD, deep in an English forest, lay a man of noble birth, dead on the ground. A single arrow had pierced his lung and killed him. 
He had been out hunting that day with friends, who later claimed they had become separated from him and he had been killed in a tragic hunting accident by a stray arrow. What his friends did next seemed both strange and against common decency, made more unusual because his younger brother Henry was in the hunting party. They all just left the body where it fell and continued on their way, except for the younger brother who rushed home in order to secure his inheritance and the family fortune, as he was next in line. The nobleman's body was later found by some peasants and was dragged off to be given an appropriate burial. Making it even more suspicious was the fact that the dead noble was none other than William II, King of England. For it was only 34 years ago that his father, Duke William of Normandy, had defeated Harold II, who was the last crowned Anglo-Saxon King of England. William then claimed the English throne as his own and became William I, commonly known as William the Conqueror. William I had a stormy and complex relationship with his four sons, and they too had a similar relationship with him and each other. His oldest son, Richard, died in a hunting accident in his late teens when he was mauled to death by an angry stag. So when William the Conqueror died in 1087 AD, the crown should have fallen to the next eldest son, Robert. But with a break from tradition, the crown instead passed to the third eldest son, who had been named after him. Therefore, William succeeded to the throne to become William II, only giving Robert the estates in France, making him the new Duke of Normandy. Both brothers were seen by most people, including their own father, as being flawed, as both men and leaders. But it was widely regarded that King William the Conqueror particularly disliked Robert and possibly saw his younger brother William as the best of a poor crop. The fourth and last son, Henry, was young at the time of his father's death, 18 or 19 years old. He was probably not considered as a candidate for the throne because of his age and being so far down in the order of succession. As for William II, he was a character who was hard to understand, full of vice and ill temper at times. Many felt he lacked the dignity and refinement needed for a king. At times he could be forceful and quite religious. So it is accepted that he was ill-suited to be a monarch and was disliked by all those around him, including his brothers. So was his death an accident as claimed by the hunting party he was with, or something far more sinister? First, we'll look at the obvious possibility that it was an accident. Hunting accidents have always been common, and being royalty is no exception to this. As an example, in 1231, King Valdemar the Younger of Denmark was accidentally shot while hunting and subsequently died of his wounds. So there is the distinct possibility that the simplest explanation is the correct one, and it was just an accident. But what makes William II's death so suspicious is the complex political situation he found himself in and how he was treated in death. Could it have been a cold and calculated assassination? The most obvious suspect was his younger brother, Henry, who was now 32. William at the time of his death was in his early 40s, and it was conceivable that he would live another 20 years. Maybe Henry was impatient to claim his God-given right of succession. And Henry's abandonment of his king and brother's body seemed callous and even brutal by medieval standards. Instead, Henry rushed off and secured the royal treasury at Winchester and got himself crowned in such haste that he didn't wait for the archbishop to arrive, which was the tradition. It may have been prudent in such unsettled times to rush off, but to instruct someone to take away his brother's body would have taken no time at all, rather than to leave it to the savage heat of the summer's day and any wildlife that may come across it. But there had been much animosity between the two brothers, and Henry had much to resent William for, as he felt he had been sidelined over the years in the matters of state. So on coming to the throne, Henry canceled many of William II's policies. Henry also had a harsh and manipulative side, so perhaps he no longer wanted to live in his older brother's shadow. Then there was the second eldest of the brothers, Robert. The very eldest was Richard, but he had died some years earlier. So tradition should have dictated the next in line for the throne was Robert, but on the death of his father, William the Conqueror, he had instead inherited the family estates in northern France and therefore became the new Duke of Normandy instead of inheriting the English throne. 
Unusually, William the Conqueror's will instructed that his son William should become King of England. Robert was said to be a skilled knight, though it was said he was also very lazy and his relationship with his father and family was a complete mess. He had led an unsuccessful rebellion against his father in 1077. Then after his younger brother William had become king, he had led yet another unsuccessful rebellion in 1088. By some miracle, he survived carrying out these acts of treason, and eventually Robert found his calling in life and was a leading figure in the First Crusade and set off for the Holy Land in 1096. In fact, four years later, he was returning home from the Holy Land when William was killed. Could this give him the perfect alibi, or was he planning to make yet another power grab ahead of his return and underestimated his younger brother who had stole his inheritance from him? It is worth considering that in the hunting party was a nobleman called Walter Tyrell of Normandy who had distant links with the royal family. Rumors emerged a few decades later that he may have killed the king by accident while trying to hunt a stag. As the story goes, he was so stricken with fear and guilt that he immediately fled to France, where he died shortly afterwards. The trouble is that the mentioning of this version of events is far and few between, emerging sometime later, and the facts are sketchy. Another possibility is that William II, who was often painted as a pleasure-seeking womanizer, had caused a jealous husband to seek revenge. This could be a possibility, as William was a confirmed bachelor who never married, and there is clear evidence that he had many affairs. So, could it have been an offended husband who had been in the hunting party, and who in a jealous rage swore vengeance and killed the king when he became separated from the primary group? Or is there one last possibility? Could it have been a group of bitter Saxons, angry at being conquered and ruled over by a group of Frenchmen who had taken their land away from their fathers and distributed it among themselves? If this was a possibility, why was there no attempt to instigate an uprising as power transferred to William's brother Henry? There is no record of this or anything that supports this theory, but records are scarce from this period due to how long ago it was, and also the fact that written records were still only carried out by a selected few, mainly the monastic orders. But it is worth considering any record of lingering Saxon insurrection would have been discouraged as it was in the English monarch's interest to portray the country as a unified nation, as it was quickly becoming one of the most powerful countries in Europe. So who killed William II? It's unlikely that we will ever know, but it seems he had many enemies. With his corpse abandoned in a forest, it was found by a group of peasants who respectfully took his body in the back of a commoner's cart to Winchester Cathedral, with no pomp or ceremony. By the time William's body got there the next day, it would have entered the state of rigor mortis. All in all, a most undignified end to a king's reign. So who killed William II of England and why? <laughs>